one of my favorite things to do is to get together with somebody over a cup of coffee and ask them to tell me their story. And when I do, I'll often ask them to tell me about their name. Why was their name chosen? What does their name mean? What's the history behind their name? Who chose your name? What does your name mean? That's an important question. Every, everyone's name means something. And if you don't know what the meaning of your name is, maybe you ought to discover the history of your name. And why was your name chosen? Was it just randomly picked out of the air or was it chosen for a particular reason? This is an important question for today's message. And I think you'll see why in a few minutes. As we were reading through Luke chapter four, just a couple of minutes ago, did you notice that Simon's name was mentioned without any kind of an introduction? We don't know who he is, but apparently the first reader of Luke knew who Simon was. And it just simply says that after synagogue, Jesus went to Simon's house. And there, Simon's mother-in-law had a fever. She was ill. They said, Jesus, would you please heal her? And Jesus took her by the hand. Immediately, her fever left her, and she got up and served them. No other mention about Simon. It's just assumed we, we know already some of the background of Jesus and Simon. And if you've read the New Testament at all, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, then you know this is not the first time that Jesus has met Simon. It's not the, in fact, they've known each other probably for several months by this time. The first time Jesus met Simon is mentioned in the Gospel of John, John chapter 1. Andrew and another disciple were following John the Baptist. And John the Baptist had just recently baptized Jesus. And whenever John the Baptist baptized Jesus, he had been told, the person you baptize in water, you're going to see on one of them, the Holy Spirit will descend upon him and remain on his shoulder in the form of a dove. That's the one. He's the Messiah. He's the one who's going to be the king. He's the one who's going to baptize with the Holy Spirit. And John testified, I saw that happen. I know who the Messiah is. Well, a day or so or 40 days later, we don't know how long it is between the baptism and when this event took place, whether it was two or three days or 40 and some days. But whenever it was, Jesus was coming by where John was preaching. And John pointed him out and said, look the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. And Andrew and the other disciple of John began to follow Jesus that day. Where are you staying, Lord? We'll come and see. And they spent the day with Jesus. Simon, I mean, rather, Andrew was so excited, he rushed home to get his brother Simon. And he said, we have found the Messiah, and convinced Simon to come and meet him. Whenever Simon came to meet Jesus, Jesus' first words recorded in John chapter 1, I think there's probably a longer conversation, but this is the important part. Jesus said, your name is Simon. I'm going to call you Cephas, which means Peter. It's Aramaic for Peter. Okay? Who named you and what does your name mean? You see, Peter has a specific meaning. The word in Greek, petros, means rock. It's a, it's a good-sized rock. You use it to build with. Certainly, it's not the foundation rock or stone upon which you're going to build an entire building. No, that, that's a different word. In fact, later on in Jesus' ministry, he refers to Simon, and he says, your name is Simon. And, or rather, he didn't say Simon. He said, your name is Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church. Now, he uses two different words here. He says, your name is Petros. And on this Petra, I will build my church. Petros is the masculine form of rock. And like I said, it's a good-sized rock. It's something you would use to build with. But your name is Petros. And on this Petra, which is a solid foundational bedrock, 
It's just a little bit under the under the uh, surface dirt. It's bedrock. And on this Petra, I will build my church. It's a strong support. And I believe if we can see the gestures of Jesus, he says, your name is Petros. And on this Petra, I will build my church. You know, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10 says that there's no other foundation that can be laid except Jesus himself. Jesus is the foundation for his church. Now, I said all that to say this. Jesus gave Simon a new name. What does that say about the relationship? Right off the bat, the first day they meet, Jesus gives him a new nickname. He starts calling him Rocky. Of course, those who know Simon know that there's nothing really stable about his life. Why would you call him Peter? Why would you call him Rock? Well, Jesus saw something in Simon within three or three and a half years from that point that he could see the development of a character that he was going to be useful in the building of the kingdom of God. He was going to be a stable character, unlike who he is now when he first meets Jesus. Because you see, Jesus is a life changer. He didn't just change his name. In three and a half years, he radically changed this man's life. Well, the following months, Simon and Andrew and James and John and Philip and Nathaniel and Bartholomew and Levi and others begin to follow Jesus and, and uh, go with him around the various towns. Now, they're not with him every single day of the week, but they are with him in a significant number of times when Jesus goes from town to town proclaiming the message about the kingdom of God is almost here. He had this very similar message that John the Baptist had. John the Baptist said, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. Be prepared for the coming of the kingdom. The kingdom of God is almost here. Repent for the kingdom of God is here. It's near to us. And Jesus had exactly the same message. Repent for the kingdom of God is near. And he was baptizing, although he himself didn't baptize anyone, his disciples did. So from the time that Jesus was baptized and then he was driven into the wilderness for 40 days and he's declared the Lamb of God by John the Baptist, Andrew and Simon and others begin following Jesus. We have the miracle of Cana, changing of water into wine. We have the driving out of the money changers out of the temple, John chapter 2. We have the original Nick at night, whenever Jesus met Nicodemus at night. We have the healing of the nobleman's son in Cana. We have Jesus moving to Capernaum, and probably around this time is the initial call of Simon, Andrew, James, and John. Come follow me. I'll make you to become fishers of men. And then there's a driving out of a demon on the Sabbath day in the synagogue, in worship time. There's a demon-possessed man. And then there's Simon's mother-in-law, who's healed, as we just read in Luke chapter 4. And Jesus travels throughout Galilee and to various synagogues, performing miracles and proclaiming the kingdom of God. Healing lepers, healing the blind, casting out demons. One of the things we find interesting about these demons when Jesus casts them out is this is not a mental thing. This is a true evil spirit possessing a person, and Jesus silenced them because they were having conversation with Jesus. Why are you here to torment us early? We know who you are, most holy one, the son of God. And Jesus rebuked them and told them, shut up, put a muzzle on it. You don't say another word. And Jesus displayed power over the demonic. And then Jesus was so popular that the crowds around the surrounding region and Judea and Jerusalem in Galilee, they had come there to hear Jesus speak. And many of them were ill. They came there to be healed. And there was such a crowd on, this, on the beach of the lake that Jesus asked Simon, can I sit in your boat and teach the crowds? Well, Simon wasn't using his boat at that particular time. 
They were washing, mending their nets. And so they said, sure, go ahead. Because you see, they'd been fishing all night long, but they hadn't caught anything. And I don't know if you know what that's like. I know what it's like just to go with a fishing pole and a line and fish and fish for hours and not catch anything. But I don't know what it's like that it's my livelihood and you go out on a boat and you drop a net and you pull up the net and all you have is seaweed and algae and, and uh, sticks and no fish. You drop it again and all night long, back-breaking, hard labor, all night long, no fish. And then Jesus is sitting on the edge of the boat, keeping the crowds on the edge of their seats. Well, they're not really seated. They're standing while he's seated, okay? And Jesus is telling them things like, what will happen if you only have the faith of a mustard seed? About the sower who sowed the seed. About the kind of faith it takes to move mountains. Whenever you pray, whatever you pray for will be given to you if you pray in my name. You need to have faith. Don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow has enough worries of itself. Don't just seek after money and all the gains of this world. God will take care of you, O oh, ye of little faith. Jesus is speaking to the crowds. And then maybe he even told the parable of the fishermen who went out to fish and the kingdom of God is like the ones who dropped the net over and they caught so many fish and then they separated the good from the bad and that's what the kingdom of God is going to be like. He dismisses the crowds and then he turns to Simon and says, you want to go fishing? And Simon says, Lord, we've been fishing all night long and we haven't caught anything. Come on. Drop your net out into the deep. All right, master. It's interesting. He uses a unique term here called master. It's, it's like the word boss or a higher supervisor. Not quite lord who owns a slave, but the boss who has the final word. And so he says, okay, you, you say the word, we'll do it. So they rowed out, and you can see maybe Jesus sitting on the boat, and he says, how about right here? <laughs> and Simon's thinking, oh boy, this is right where we were last night. I don't know if that happened or not, but he drops the net over the side of the boat, and almost no sooner had the net hit the water, and fish began to fill that huge net. He and Andrew began pulling for all they were worth, and it was just too much for them. The nets were almost breaking. They were so full of fish. They called for their partners, John and James, Zebedee boys, come out here, we need your help. And all the rest of the ones who were working with them jumped in their boat, and they came out, and they helped them unload that net full of fish, and they dropped it again, and they filled up their boats, and they ended up filling up both boats, we're told, in Luke chapter 5, to the point that both boats were almost sinking. Now, at this time, Simon is so busy with the catching and pulling and dumping of fish, he didn't have time to think this thing through. But as he drops the last bunch of fish into his boat, it hits him. We were on our own. We were fishing all night long, and we hadn't caught anything. <laughs> One time out with Jesus and two boats full. Now, I, I wonder, if, if it were you or if it were me, might he say, hmm, I wonder if Jesus would be willing to go into business with me. I mean, we can make a fortune. <laughs> hey, Lord, you want to go fishing tomorrow? <laughs> But, but it hits him. He's been listening to the teachings of Jesus. He's been walking with him for months, listening to him in the synagogues, watching him perform miracles. He just saw a miracle earlier, the healing of his mother-in-law instantaneously when he took her hand, the fever was gone and she immediately was able to get up and serve. It wasn't just a psychological thing. It was a full physical healing. He saw it with his own eyes. 
And now, oh, oh, and you can just see the unraveling of a man as he recognizes here is a man who not only teaches something, but he does what he teaches. He is who even the demons claim him to be, the Holy One of God. He's the Lamb of God. He really is the Messiah. And then Simon comes to Jesus and drops to his knees and says, you, you have to depart from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. You have no idea where I've been, where I've slept. You don't know what kind of life I've been leaving. Lord, I, I don't deserve to be with you. And Jesus raises him up and he says, come on, Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you're gonna be not catching fish, but catching people. Now, I don't believe that this passage, or I should say, I believe that this is a separate event than what happens that's recorded early in the Gospel of Mark, where he initially says, come follow me, I'll make you to become fishers of men. Later, he, he is this event, and this is the final call for, for Peter, Simon Peter, to surrender all and be a disciple, a sold out disciple, to be, we would use the word today, radicalized. He is willing to be radicalized. That is to have his whole way of thinking completely turned right side up so that he can see the world the right way. I think he's heard enough from Jesus to recognize this. I want to learn how to live and how to love from that man. He is the son of God. I believe it. In fact, later on, not very much longer, long after this, Jesus says, who are people saying that I am? Well, some people say you're Elijah. Some people say you're Jeremiah. Some people say you're one of the prophets, John the Baptist. <laughs> he said, well, who do you say that I am? And Peter's the first one to respond. He said, you are the Christ, the anointed one. You are the Christ the son of the living God. And Jesus said, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, Simon, but my father in heaven. And truly, your name is Peter. And on this rock, I want to build my church. And the gates of Hades, the gates of death will not prevail against it. Hell itself cannot prevail. Now, In this calling of Peter, Simon Peter, we have the beginnings of a changed man who, Simon means sifting sand. He's very unstable in his character. But because of his walk with Jesus, he becomes solid in his character. Even whenever he disappoints Jesus to the extreme and denies that he even knows him, at whenever Jesus is being tried. Remember, outside the courtyard, whenever Peter was by the fire warming, he's confronted three times, and Peter denies three times that he even knows Jesus. He swears to God he doesn't know him. And yet, Jesus forgives. How do you know that, Kev? Well, I know that because after the resurrection, Jesus told, or the angel told um, and Jesus told Mary, you go back and tell the disciples to come on and meet me in Galilee. Go tell the disciples and Peter. <laughs> I'm sure if he just said, go tell the disciples, that they would not, uh, Peter would have said, okay, you guys go ahead. I, I'm not a disciple anymore. But you know, a failure does not make you a failure. I mean, when you fail, and we do, a failure, or many failures for that matter, do not make you a failure. It's not that you fall. It's what direction are you looking 
What direction are you going as you get back up? And who's helping you get back up again? So I'm suggesting to you that we have the same attitude in us that Peter had whenever he was initially called by Christ. Don't be afraid. Get up. From now on, you're going to be catching people. It's time for you to make a decision. Now, many of you have, and I'm going to ask you, do you always do, do you ever just make a decision one time and one time only? Or are there renewals of those decisions? Are there times that you need to come back and reflect on the decision that you've made or to recommit yourself, to revitalize, to, to resurrect your commitment? It's time to get serious about the Lord. Our time is short. I don't know if we have a few days, a few months, a few years, a thousand years. We just don't know. I do know this. We are one day closer now than we ever were before to the second coming of Christ. And I'm not saying that you better get ready for Jesus. I'm saying you, you don't want to put this off. You see, this is time that is valuable. Don't waste it just living life. Live life on purpose as a disciple of Christ. There's where our hope is. There's where our strength is. There is where our, our development comes, is being a disciple of Jesus, radicalized by Jesus, where he changes the way we think. How does he do that? You've got to get your head in the book. You've got to get together with other Christians and talk about Jesus with each other. You and I, you and I need to be disciples who are helping others become disciples by helping them know who Jesus is, by explaining and expressing to them the love of God. That's what he's called us to do, to catch people. Or in the tax collector's term, as he called Matthew, he wouldn't have called him to become a fisherman. He would have said, from now on, you're not going to collect money. You're going to collect people for the kingdom. Whatever it is that your life is, God's calling you, and he wants you to be actively involved in his kingdom, kingdom enterprise. Won't you make a commitment to him and let him literally not just change your name, but change your character? There was a man that was going out fishing. He'd go out fishing every weekend, and he always got his limit. Nobody else caught as many fish as old Ralph. And in fact, he'd gotten a reputation. And one day, news about him going fishing had reached the entire neighborhood. And so they all came out on the shores of the bank where they could, or the, the bank. <laughs> yeah, they came out to watch him fish. He got in his rowboat and the game warden came up to him and said, I want to go with you. I want to see how you do this. He said, go ahead. They got in the boat and they rowed out in the middle. And when they reached a spot, Ralph said, this looks good. He reached into his tackle box, pulled out a stick of dynamite, lit it, and threw it into the water. A couple minutes later, <clears throat> there was an explosion. Fish started rising to the surface, and he got his net and began to scoop up buckets of fish. Got his full limit. The game warden couldn't believe his eyes. He stood up red-faced, and he said, Do you realize you have broken every ordinance, every code, every law, every statute? I mean, I can't believe what you just did. I can't believe what our eyes is. Ralph just reached over, picked up a stick of dynamite, lit it, and he handed it to the game warden. And he said, did you come to fish or did you come to talk? All right, did you come to just sit? Did you turn on this video just to be entertained for a while? Or are you ready to make a serious decision about Jesus? He's calling you. What's your answer going to be?